So that said, uh, where we're going to go next is I, I've got a whole bunch of different kinds of processes and uh, signal chains set to test for you or set to kind of demonstrate for you. And I think the way I want to do this is this way. I, I've been kind of wrestling with this this morning on how I was going to actually do this. So just bear with me. Because it's a lot to show. Uh, and the way we're going to do this is we're going to look at some of these processes. Uh, we're going to look at, you know, just the basic uh, tone or pink noise. We're going to look at it in FFT so we can see if there's any equalization kind of being created by the processor. And then we'll look at it in Spectrum to check out the harmonic content that is being added by each one of these things. Okay. So the, uh, hopefully I can explain this as we go along here. So let's get our first one set up here. Stand by for me. Somebody has their mic open. And are typing on the keyboard. I think it's Martin Ververos. Yeah, I'm sorry about that. I just muted. Thank you, sir. Okay. Um, actually, I'm going to get back here and shut this off. All right. So the way this is going to go is I'm going to, I've got, basically two instantiations of this plugin set up on each one of these tests. And we're going to look at just kind of a moderate version and then a little more extreme version uh, in both noise and in tone. And then we'll wrap back around at the end and listen to some, um, some drums and actually it's just drums. I, I was going to add some bass guitar to this, but I got, I ran out of time this morning. Uh, so we'll just listen to some drums with these processes. And then we'll do a little bit of parallel work where it's a dry signal plus the harmonic enhanced signal added together. Okay, no compression or anything per se, just the harmonic. Uh, although some of the compressors will do that. Okay, so let's get it going here. So um, let me just check myself here. Yeah, so this is tone. So we're going to start off in pink noise here. I think. And I'm going to turn the stream down, otherwise you're going to go crazy here. So just watch your screen here. So we're going to start off in pink noise, and we're just going to take a look at this in transform. There we go. All right, so this is twin tube, and it's out of circuit right now, I think. Yes, one second for me. I'll get there, Robert. All right, I'll just go ahead and put it in circuit. And you can see uh, already when we put it in circuit in terms of magnitude, you get a little, uh, little phase bend there and a little bit of low frequency and high frequency effect as well. All right, let's look at a little more extreme version of it now. And you can see just a little more bend in it. But let's go take a look at it in a harmonic now. That's where things really show up here. All right, so I'll take it out of circuit again for a second. So you can see that's out of circuit now. And just in circuit, it's adding a lot of harmonic content. And on this particular plugin, you have the ability to add harmonics as well as saturation. So you can, you can actually create some odd, or, odd order, even order combinations here if you want uh, that are pretty effective. And through different center point boosts on this, you can create different kind of styles of preamp overdrive. Uh, and I, I would tell you, I would share with you this little piece of information. You know, at Avid, when we've done some preamp comparisons, uh, trying to figure out, you know, if we're going to emulate pre's or whatever we're going to do, the amazing thing that I discovered during those tests was that all preamps, this is going to be a really controversial thing to say, but I, I just have my own experience to back it up. All the preamps, when they were in their linear state, sounded amazingly close to each other. 
Like, I mean, they sounded almost to the point where you just thought, why even emulate these Paris? They don't sound that much different to each other until you started to distort them. And then they all sounded dramatically different. They, they all had very different characteristics of distortion uh, that would come in as a part of the, pre, uh, of the preamp. So, you know, once you start to get your head around those kind of things, I'm, and I, there's, like I said, there's nothing scientific to this. I just have in my mind, okay, a Neve pre kind of sounds like this kind of brightness when it dist distorts. An API kind of sounds like this. And I've kind of gone in and mapped those things out in my own settings with this device and it works really really effectively as a preamp emulation uh, so you know it's a it's a really cool device okay so that's that guy and again keep in mind we're only looking at one frequency here this is just 1k tone so all right let's take a look at uh let's take a look at uh phoenix yes let's go to phoenix here. It's a lot of button pushing today. Hang in there with me. Okay, so Phoenix is tape emulation um, in digital form, and you can see it's got a very simplistic harmonic involved there, right? Uh, that's a that's an odd order harmonic that is being added to it there. It's that the three K, right? Yeah. Uh, and again, you know, it's a game of subtlety here. There's a little more drive into it. Oh. So, you know, I, I think I've had people say that to me. Wow, it's hard. I, I don't hear all that much difference with the Phoenix. But collectively, when you have this added a bunch of, uh, across a bunch of inputs, it makes a difference. And, and honestly, guys, it's very, very much like recording in analog, which is also a game of nuance. You know, it doesn't take a lot of overdrive into a tape, uh, you know, circuit and and the tape itself to get a lot of additive effect over the course of a lot of inputs, all right? So I would caution you just to go easy when you're trying to get this and try to train your ears to hear it even at the lower levels, okay? Now, here's the other cool thing. Remember, I talked about uh, when you're doing analog emulation, um, you know, it's in stages, right? You can add things together to get more of the effect, and, and this will become more apparent once we get to the music. I've also got the twin tube ahead of this so let's take a look at the, that's the Phoenix, and now I'm going to add in the SP, the twin tube there. Oops, sorry, I did it on the wrong one. The twin tube there, and now you can see that's a combination of twin tube and tape compression there. Right, so lots of different stuff going on there. All right, let's go back and look at Phoenix in FFT now. I'll take that out of circuit. Oops, sorry, I'm on the wrong preset here. <clears throat> so you can see there, even with the pieces in circuit, yes, is that right? Yes. We don't get a huge amount of equalization that's taking place there, right? We're, we are just getting harmonic shift uh, in the signal. And, you know, I mean, there's a good lesson to be learned here in the difference between equalization and harmonic enhancement, right? When we're doing harmonic enhancement like this, I mean, look how clean our phase trace is overall, even with those plugins in, right? So uh, this is a really good way to get things, you know, the old recording engineers learned this long ago. It's a really good way to get things fatter and brighter without using an equalizer, okay? All right, let's go back to tone again. And we're going to move over to... Oh, this is real tape. This is cool. Sorry for all the bouncing back and forth here. But there we go. All right, so we're going to look at real tape now. Uh, and this is a, you know, this is one of those things I think, unless you've heard, you know, you got your ears really tuned to tape saturation. This is a hard one for guys to hear if they've never experienced it in the studio. But tape, uh, real tape saturation is actually a very effective emulator of tape saturation. So let's put it in circuit and see what's happening here. 
All right, so there, yeah, you can see a, a fair amount of harmonic coming up in there in both odd and even uh, order harmonic, but the odd is the dominant harmonic there, right? Let's look at the other one here. This is a little more extreme version of it. And, you know, even, even with this uh, plug-in, you know, you can add things like tape noise and all kinds of other crazy stuff to it. But in terms of a saturation plug-in, uh, it has some cool stuff to offer, as you'll hear on the drums, okay? Uh, let's take a look at it in FFT. Oops. Wrong direction here. And yeah, as you can see here now, right, that's tape actually creating some equalization on your signal, right? Some low frequency uh, stuff happening there. There's probably a little bit of high frequency stuff happening there as well. Uh, but it's, it's definitely noticeable in the bottom end, right? So pretty cool stuff. A little more, little more extreme example of it there. Okay, let's move on to our next one. This is McDSP Analog Channel. And, you know, this is a kind of a combination of those two things where it's a kind of preamp and tape emulator combined, you know, much like uh, I was showing you with Phoenix and uh, TwinTube. This actually, you know, does it kind of in all in one plug in here. Uh, so let's get back to our, actually, let's just look at it in FFT here first and then we will go do it. Yeah, so check this out, right? So that is actually equalization that is being created uh, by the, uh, the device itself, right? So there's some equalization in there, but there's also some harmonic content uh, that can happen in here as well. This is the more extreme version of it. Okay, so let's go look at that in Spectrum. And noise, tone. All right, so that's bypassed. And then once we take it in, we see some odd order harmonic there, uh, plus the equalization of the tape, right? Those are the two components of it there. Is this making sense to you guys? Is this, an, is this an okay way to see it? You'll get to hear it in a few minutes, I promise. Is this okay, though? I think, I think it's a great way to see it. Good. Yeah, because this gets more extreme the farther we go here. So check this out. All right, so let's move on to, we're in Spectrum now, so we'll actually I'll kick it back. No, we'll just stay in, we'll just flop back and forth, save a little time here. So we'll stay in Spectrum. Let's look at Sansamp now, which this is my secret weapon. I'm just going to tell you ahead of time. I, I use this thing in more places than I ever, ever dreamed I would, but it's just an amazing tool. So obviously this is an amplifier emulator, right? A guitar amp emulator. So it's going to be ultra rich in terms of its harmonic possibility, right? And you can definitely overdo it with this plugin. I'd be the first to admit it. But if you really want to reshape something or enhance something with a parallel patch, man, Sansamp is a place to do it. I'm telling you. If you guys, if you guys want some really good tips on how to use this, uh, I haven't put them together yet, but go watch any of the videos by Chad Blake. If you haven't watched any of Chad Blake's videos, please go do that and just check out all the places that he uses Sansamp. It will blow your mind because it's not overly apparent that it's being used that way, uh, but he, he's a great, great use of it. He's, he's inspired me in a lot of the stuff I do with it, for sure. All right, so you can see the harmonic information there. Let's look at it in FFT. Oops, sorry, I got to go to noise here. There we go. Oops, sorry, wrong switches. Buttonitis here. There we go. That looks more like Sansamp. <laughs> 
And as you can tell, right, crazy magnitude trace, crazy phase trace, and really all that kind of flutter that you see up there, you know, above 8K is because there's nothing above 8K coming out of the unit. Uh, that's why it's so unstable up there. But a lot of phase shift going on in this box and a lot of equalization, but there's also a lot of power in it. Uh, you know, I, would I use it as the sole source? Sure, under the right circumstances, but probably more often than not, uh, if I'm not using it as a sole guitar source, meaning, meaning I'm using it as a bass guitar emulator, uh, amp emulator, if I'm using it on drums, et cetera, usually I'm using it as an addition, as a parallel addition, uh, to be able to add some quality to the, uh, that particular unit, or that particular input, I should say. Okay, so yeah, kind of crazy looking, right? Need a more extreme version of it. Okay, let's uh, let's move on to eleven. This is the uh, Avid amplifier emulator, uh, and I, you know, I'll be honest. I haven't had as much luck using this in this situation as I have Sansamp, but I think part of that is because I'm just so dang familiar with the Sansamp. I used to use the uh, the uh, the actual version, the hardware version of it to do the similar thing. So I, I'm not, the jury's still kind of out for me on 11 yet, but it, it does work as you'll hear with the bass and drums once we do that. So get it on here. All right, so yeah, you can see severe amounts of distortion and harmonic information here. Now I, I've just tried to pick something that sounds pseudo usable for drums, etc. There's not a lot of research going into these sounds here. So that's a more extreme version of it here, oops. And you know, something else to keep in mind here, I believe 11 was the one I had to do this. Uh, I had to reverse polarity on these plugins as their parallel returns, because as happens a lot of times in an overdrive circuit, the polarity will actually reverse by the time it gets to the output as a function of the amp design. And 11 is a very specific amp modeler. It was a component amp model. Uh, so it will work just exactly like an amp in terms of polarity as well. Okay, let's take a look at it in uh, Spectrum. Oops. And I gotta go tone. There we go. So you can see, you know, much richer in terms of harmonic content here. And this would go, I mean, this would go crazy as you start to overdrive it. I mean, you can really get some uh, serious amounts of saturation happening here if you want to do it, right? Okay, let's, uh, let's move into some compressors. I picked uh, Smack and the arouser to kind of compare, which are, are interesting to say the least uh, and uh, kind of reaffirming for me in some ways. All right, so let's go to, uh, we're gonna be, yeah, we're in spectrum here. So let's go to smack. And here, on the circuit. So, wow, a lot of harmonic content there. Now here's the cool thing about smack is that the harmonic content is not a function of the amount of compression, right? It's not a, mount, a matter of the, uh, the amount of drive you put into the unit. On the upper right-hand corner there, you can see you can actually just turn on odd, even, or uh, any amount of harmonic content into it. And this kind of proves to me why I like this device. For some reason, I always end up gravitating back to smack. I really, really like this as a drum and bass compressor. It's, it's still one of my favorites. Uh, I, I still think it just sounds fantastic. If, if, you know, if quote unquote fat is what you're looking for, this is a really, really good device for it. Okay. Okay, let's take a look at the, oh, oh actually, we want to look at that in um, Trent or uh, in FFT, don't we?
So obviously a much more normalized uh, frequency response there. You're getting some uh, high frequency boost there. It's, it's maybe, maybe a dB, dB and a half of high frequency boost there in magnitude. And I'm certain that is all related to those harmonics. I got to believe that. Let's turn it off first. Yeah, you can see once I take the harmonics out uh, of that unit, then that high frequency rise goes away. So, you know, this is a nice way to get things brighter without equalization there. Sorry, I got to let somebody into the room. Stand by. Okay, so pretty cool. All right, let's move on to the arouser. We'll look at it in FFT first. Arouser is in. Yeah, stand by there. I got just I didn't get the offset matched up here. So, you know, little to no equalization as a function of the device uh, and its processes. Uh, but let's take a look at it in Spectrum and see what's happening there. And voila, lots of harmonic content there as well. <clears throat> Looks like it's predominantly odd order harmonic, or they have the dominance uh, in the units. Get some more saturation in here. You can see as I turn up the saturation, it's the odd order harmonics that are actually starting to really creep up there. And, and for my money, this is why people have a tendency to like this unit, uh, the aggression in this unit, right? can come across as a really aggressive sounding compressor and really good. I, this is probably, I, this would be in my top three or four for sure. All right, so let's move on to some more kind of specific. Uh, somebody got a question there? Oh, Jeremy and uh, Roslyn's, would you please mute your microphones? Appreciate it. Thank you. All right, so well, there's the FFT going crazy. Let's go to let's go to pink noise again, and we're gonna the next one I'm gonna bring up is lo-fi because uh, I know that there are guys out there that use this. I haven't used this as much for this kind of work uh, as as other plugins, but it's an interesting one for sure. Uh, and again, with some uh, with some discipline, you can get some pretty good tones out of this. So this is uh, lo-fi. Let me make sure it's in circuit here. There we go. And as you can see, uh, once it's in circuit, uh, all kinds of wild things are going on. Frequency response rise. You know, there's almost no tone. Uh, let me turn this down just a little bit. Or no upper tones in it. it this is meant to truly make something lo-fi. All right. Scott, I'll be right with you. I just saw your hand go up there, buddy. Hang in there with me. And similar thing there in the other. All right, so let's take a look at spectrum here. And as you can see, really evenly spaced, um, you know, descending a amplitude of harmonics. I mean, it's just a harmonic generator is really all this thing is. And it will, if you want something to go really, really saturated sounding and lo-fi sounding, this is your guy. You know, I, I would say this or, uh, you know, McDSP uh, Futz box is a really good one for this kind of work as well. So, you know, if you're trying to really squawk something up or make it, you know, intentionally make it ugly sounding, it, it, this is a really, really good choice. Scott, you got a question, man. Go for it. Uh, now that you're getting into the nitty gritty, how much of this are you actually taking into, into effect when you're actually mixing? I mean, this is very, the, you know, this is a big scientific side of it, but what and how are you placing this into your live mixes on a daily basis? Uh, I'll cover that when we move into music listening here. I'm going to, like I said, I'm going to bring back, we're going to actually do some auditioning of kick and snare 
with these processes added on them one at a time here. So you'll get to hear the differences in them as we go forward. And then I'll talk about my overall approach to doing it. Does that sound fair? Yeah, that's fine. I mean, I'll, kind of going on to that though, like everything you're showing, are you actually doing it more by ear when you're mixing or are you actually using like a lot of this to see it as you're doing it? Totally by ear. Okay. Totally by ear. I, although having said that, the reason I can do it totally by ear more effectively probably is because I've gone in and done this ahead of time and kind of had some expectation of what is going to happen, you know? Right. That makes sense. Yeah. Yeah. I've kind of gone in to explore some of these and go, okay, what the hell is happening right there? Let me, let me understand this before I, you know, commit this to, to what I'm doing. Okay. So let's go to uh, where we're we at. We're in spectrum here. Let's go to the inflator by Oxford here. That's this guy. This is a really good, clean uh, harmonic generator. This one, if you want to keep things really natural sounding and yet still have a lot of harmonic content, this, is, this one is a, comes highly recommended. I really like this processor. So this is inflator in spectrum. And you can see, again, very evenly spaced harmonics, not a lot of peaky information in it. We'll go to transfer here. We'll go to noise. <clears throat> and as you can see, it's not, like I said, it's a really natural sounding plugin, not any equalization actually being created here uh, with the device, just a timbre or timbre and tonality change there. Okay. Got a few more to go through here, about three, four more. So we're going to get into some extreme things now. Let's take a look at uh, actual guitar pedals, right? Uh, and I shouldn't say actual guitar pedals, virtual versions of actual guitar pedals. And as you can imagine with these distortion pedals, they're going to be very aggressive in their distortion. Uh, and, you know, obviously if you want to set up something to be super distorted outside of the realms of a guitar going into an amplifier. You know, you have to be judicious with these things. Even if you're using an actual device, you know, inserted on something to do it, you have to be pretty uh, selective in how you do it. Uh, and that'll come screaming at you here shortly here. So we're in pink noise. Let's do this. Yeah, and as you can see here, here's the first pedal I've chosen. I, I've chosen two very different sounding pedals here just to give you a sense of it. Obviously, a lot of bottom end rolled off, a lot of top end rolled off. There's a lot of equalization being created with this device, even though it has tone controls, et cetera, on it. And then once we look at it in spectrum, you'll really get the picture here. So there's hardly any distortion in play on this device right now. It's almost like it's just in circuit. Uh, but as we add saturation to it, you'll see it just goes full on where, as you can kind of see there, and, and that's only at about 11 o'clock on the distortion, right? But the harmonics are almost as loud as the fundamental there. Uh, so, you know, that would not be uncommon in a guitar situation that you might want something like that going in an amplifier. But your chances of using it making it usable on a signal like a vocal or a drum or something like that with that much saturation on it's pretty unlikely. So again, you know, know what the device is capable of, get a sense of, you know, where the settings are and what you, how you want to use them. And, you know, you'll have a much better, you'll, you'll do less searching around and fumbling around trying to find it. Let's go to another pedal. This is a different sounding pedal. <laughs> Right, so this is another uh, guitar pedal. This is White Boost. Uh, this is one of the pedals in the 11 set. And, sorry, you can see my smart kind of going crazy there. It'll, it'll settle out of that in a minute. I have yet to figure out why it does that. <clears throat> but again, as you start to add more gain to it, this is with the gain knob really almost all the way down. Come on, smart, settle down. Let me start and stop it again. Almost acts like you got a bad connection there. It's not. I've, I've chased it for a week, and it's just something about the signal making it do it. So 
I'm just adding gain now on the pedal and a similar result, right? You can just see all the upper, upper, upper harmonics come into play there and become almost as loud as the fundamental. But look how dominant uh, the odd, or odd order harmonics are there. So kind of cool. All right. Oh, and we didn't look at that in FFT. Let's do that because it's fun. So yeah, you can kind of see that similar response where it's rolling off top and bottom. Uh, not near as dramatic as the last pedal though, right? So, you know, that in your thought process is if you were thinking about using this on something, you might think, okay, well, at least I can have somewhat more of a regular frequency response with this pedal in than I would the previous one. Previous one is dramatically shaped uh, in terms of its frequency response, right? And as I add more gain to it here, you can see it's just, it doesn't really change frequency response, but the harmonic addition is going to make it sound dramatically different. All right, let's go to the last set here. So I got some Waves plugins in here too. Waves does a, always does a really good job of handling harmonic stuff. So I thought we ought to have them in the game here. So let's took, uh, yeah, let's look in FFT here. So I've got two or three different uh, types of uh, harmonic uh, boxes here. Uh, first one is the Red 17. This is, you know, obviously the copy out of the Abbey Road console. Uh, and you could use this on all kinds of stuff uh, instrumentation wise. So let me put it in circuit. And the thing you will notice, uh, the thing I've noticed the most about the Waves thing is that it does uh, put equalization into it. Like a lot of their sound is based in equalization that is happening as well as harmonic information uh, in the boxes. So you can see the curve that is putting on it right now. Uh, once I put it into circuit, and this has got some drive in it, as you'll see here in Spectrum. So let's go to Spectrum here. And here we're back to a little more odd, or I mean even order harmonic. Uh, it's a little more dominant than the odd here. Uh, but all of this is available to us in the device to add more or less of it. But you can see, com certainly compared to something like a guitar pedal, this is going to be way more manageable. You know, you're just going to hear the frequency response of it change a bit and, and get enhanced by that harmonic. It's going to be a much more subtle but effective way to do it, right? Let's take a look at uh, one of their tape emulations here. This is... Uh, this is the Abbey Road, um, one of their Abbey Road plugins. So uh, emulation-wise, the thing that's interesting here, I think, is that uh, look at where the noise level is now, right? They're using noise as part of the sound here, right? This, they actually have the noise level relatively high. Here, I'll turn it down a bit. But that's actually noise you can add with the plugin, right? To simulate tape noise. Now, you know, obviously, if we're trying to add harmonic information, on inputs and things like that for this kind of thing. You know, you, you, you may, may or may not want tape noise in there. I don't, I don't think in a live setting I would want the noise in there, you know. But the nice thing, again, in analog is you have the, I mean, in digital is you have the ability to turn it off, right? And that part of it's great. All right, so you have a saturation control here as well if you want to use that on it. Just try to get some more harmonic information in there. All kinds, I mean, that's pretty, that might, it's not even pretty, that's really extreme right there. So a lot of, uh, a lot of possibility with that. It's a really good sounding plugin too. I really like that guy. Let's take a look at more of a mastering style or a bus driven compression here. This is uh, a, another one that's meant to be like bus driven compression. But again, look at the noise level, right? Uh, that's that's being added to that. So I'm going to turn that down. Just so we can get a little bit of view of it. <laughs> Maybe I'm not turning it down. Okay, let's take a look at these in FFT. All right, so again, uh, that is the one we're looking at there. Um, 
obviously a lot of equalization in play there, a big high frequency boost, a big low frequency boost, which is, you know, kind of this emulated um, tape path. This is kind of, you know, a vinyl emulation, right? So there's going to be a lot of other information in here. There's a lot of wow and flutter being added to this. That's, I'm sure that's why you're seeing the phase trace go crazy there uh, with this kind of plug-in. So, uh, you know, again, you want to be careful here. You want to use these things kind of in the in the spirit that they're meant to be used in many ways, right? Let's take, let's go back to the tape deck and look at it now in the same way. And you can see all the wow and flutter is gone now. Oops, right here. Although we could, I think we can put it back in here if we want. Yeah, see a little modulation there. But you know, you can see the equalization in there, right? That's kind of got a top boost a little bit of a mid boost, and then a little bit of a, uh, let's see, are you guys on the right? How come you're not seeing that F of T screen? Are you guys seeing, something is amiss here, one second. Are you guys seeing that screen there? Oh, I see it. I, I just got it blocked off in my own confidence monitor here. Sorry about that. There we go. All right, so cool stuff, right? Who's excited to go try some of these processes when you get back? I would say to you, go slow. Go slow, man. All right, let's get some uh, let's get some audio going here because we are audio guys, and let's get here the settings. All right. So we're going to go back through them now, and this is going to require some listening on your part. It's really going to require some training on your part to start to hear these subtleties uh, because they are subtle and, uh, but they can be very effective, right? So we're gonna start off with uh, the twin tube thing again. We're gonna go back from the top again and go through these and we'll try to do this relatively quick here. Um, so the way you'll know which one I'm on, let's see here, we're not gonna need the FFT for this. All right, so if you can take a look, let me annotate so you know where it is. If you look here, you'll see which channel I'm on. So this is TwinTube Plus. This is the, uh, just some normal settings on TwinTube. And then here, oops, I'm gonna change this. Here, you'll see that it's twin tube plus plus, right? Which means there's a little more gain and harmonic addition to it. All right, so what we're gonna do is listen to each one of those, and then we'll listen to it in parallel with the source. Okay, so you can get a sense of what it, what it works like as an adder, all right? Let me clear this out of here, and I'll just do this. You're gonna to wanna to look for the plugin that's got the orange and the red around it, that's going to tell you the channel that you're on. Because I can't, I can't show the overhead console as well as this and have it make any sense to you. Here. All right, so let's do this. All right, so let's try it out. See how we go here. All right, so let's get some signal to you. That level seem all right for you guys? Okay, so this is just a kick and a snare. There's no equalization, no nothing on this. They're both just coming down the same channel, and we're gonna listen to each one of these processes on it and then do a parallel addition, okay? So I'll try to shut up as much as I can here. one more time just to get your ears tuned in. This is no process. This is the first process. And the third process. 
So what you should pick up right there on that third one is a lot more harmonic information and some saturation, right? Almost sounds like the snare drum goes backwards a little bit, but is much brighter. Listen to this compared to the first one, which is no process. Hear the difference there? Are you guys picking up on the differences there? Yeah, yeah. It's and I. I've intentionally made this a little dramatic, hopefully to, uh, to drive this home, uh, but we'll hear it together. All right, so th remember, this is just preamp emulation that we're using here right now, right? Just preamp emulation to kind of create some, some overdrive sound, some uh, combination of harmonic and saturation, right? No different than we would try to find that sweet spot, maybe a little above the sweet spot in an analog pre to create this kind of sound, right? But here we're going to listen to it in parallel. All right, so here's the non-processed and I'm going to add either one of the uh, processes here. So here's our first one which is the light process. And now here comes the heavily affected. Okay. So you kind of get the sense, right? There's, there's no equalization going on here. This is just adding harmonic content to get it to happen, right? Uh, and there's some goodness that comes with that. Remember when we were looking at our FFT trace of that uh, twin tube unit, right? There was hardly any equal, there was no equalization in terms of the tone. All you were hearing was an enhancement of harmonics, right? Okay, so think about the, the uh, the, the possibilities there with regard to phase, right? Our phase trace stays very clean, but yet we've brightened and uh, beefed up the signal as we do it, right? Okay, we're going to start going through these a little bit faster now. Uh, and this next one is Phoenix, but I'm also going to use that opportunity to show you Phoenix plus preamp, right? So just like if we were in the studio, we're going to do some preamp uh, harmonic enhancement, then drive it into tape and see what the result of that. We're gonna do that for both Phoenix and Real Tape, okay? So let's start off with our basic signal. And this is the same signal with basic Phoenix. Very slight difference there. More pronounced. Again, subtle, but if you're listening to the right things, you can feel the snare drum start to flatten a little bit. That's the a result of the compression. This is dry. Okay, let's listen to them in parallel, and I'm just going to do just the extreme in parallel with the dry. And I'm going to mute the extreme. All right, now we're going to take and put the preamp emulation ahead of uh, the Phoenix, okay? Which is how it would come in a normal analog chain, right? We would preamp distort, saturate first, and then hit it with tape. All right, so here we go. All right, so this is uh, with the, this. Oops, sorry, buttonitis. This is with, uh, without the preamp emulation, and I'm going to kick it in here. Okay, so that's both. Let's do that on the extreme channel now. now you can really hear it there. All right, so here comes the preamp M. And then I'm going to add the source in parallel.
just the source. Getting the idea? Now, I, I, I'll totally grant to you, there's a little bit of an amplitude bump when both are in. I totally, totally agree with you on that. I, I didn't take the time to go in and level adjust it. It just would have taken more time than it was worth here. But I assure you, it's not just getting louder. There is actually a tonality change there as a result of the harmonics, right? Let's listen to that same drill on real tape. That is just the primary real tape. The, oops, sorry, let me get here. This guy. And you can really feel the snare drum flatten out and push back there, right? Which is a, a, absolutely a uh, you know a function of tape compression, emulation, there. Not quite as much tape drag. And no tape drag. And we'll listen to it in parallel. So that's the minimal real tape with parallel. And this is the extreme version. heard that sound before. I like that. Okay, let's carry on. We're just going to keep chugging along here. So this is uh, Analog Channel by McDSP. This is no... Uh, this is the dry signal. This is the Analog Channel. that bottom end EQ on that one, right? And compression. Remember, the analog channel is like a combination of drive, tape, and tape saturation, right? And see the EQ curve that is in the bottom end of it there. All right, so this is dry. First setting. Second I like that on the bass drum. That sounds good. All right, let's listen in parallel. So here's uh, dry plus the first analog channel. Pretty spanking right there. Let's uh, listen to the second analog channel. A lot more peak information on the snare there now. Groovy? Want to keep going? Is it making any sense on the other end of the internets here? You all sleeping? <laughs> I'll, tell you, I'll tell you, through the rock sands, they sound, sounds pretty good. Good. Uh, Gear, go ahead, man. Sorry, you got your hand up. I just wondered, um, are you going to show us some uh, tape saturation on cymbals? Would that make sense for the bright, harsh, troublesome cymbals? Uh, I, I could. I, I would have to pull it up here in some way. I actually probably take me more time than it's worth here. Maybe I'll try to get that between now and the next time we come back. Uh, but yeah, you know, needless to say, I mean, when you hear that kind of top end enhancement on it, and honestly, I, I'll speak from experience here because I made this mistake once, uh, tracking a band to analog, uh, where we, the symbols caught me. I, I, you know, I had a good chunk of drive going on in the tape. I was running pretty hot tape. And sure enough, when we got back to mix, I was like, oh boy. Uh, you know, we kind of overdid it on the tape drive because the cymbals got really fizzy. 
you know, and that, that's a that's the first sure sign that you, you had too much tape drive uh, on the tracks. You know, once we started adding everything together, especially the drum kit, because we had a lot of overhead miking and room miking, all of a sudden the cymbals became a really big problem. You know, and and you know, compare that to what we're doing now. We're only using that process on the kick and snare right now. And that's kind of the difference of what we can do in analog versus, or in digital versus analog. You know, in that situation, all channels were aligned the same. The only control we had over the amount of drive was the amount of push that we did to the tape machine, right? So it, we, we had control over it, don't get me wrong. I, I made the mistake. But here we can avoid that, that possibility of mistake by just not applying this process to the symbols if we want to avoid it, right? You can you can stay out of the stay out of the harm's way there, so to speak. You follow me there, Gear? Yeah. So uh, tape saturation is not the way to go to make uh, smoother symbols. <sighs> Certainly brighter symbols. I don't know about smoother symbols. Yeah, yeah. I'd be very careful there because there, you know, the thing with symbols is uh, there is a lot of high frequency information there already. You know, uh, so you just got to be really judicious with it. You got to be very careful there. And honestly, I think that's why, I, I, again, I'm just going to go on my instincts here. I think that's why a lot of orchestral guys have a tendency to shy back from harmonic information in their recordings, you know. I, I mean, think about all the high-frequency information that's happening in an orchestra, you know. You'd, you'd have to be super careful there, super careful. All right, we're moving into the land of Sansamp here. This is going to get fun. All right, so here is our dry signal. Here comes our sans amp on its own. Whoa. But let your memory banks work there for a second and think about how much that sounds like drums recorded in the 60s. Let's go an extreme version of it. It's a little more preamp drive on that. You can tell it's a little more distorted. All right, so let's go uh, dry kick and snare plus the first sand amp, this guy. Right, so this is just kick and snare. This is the sand amp here. Mm, I like that. What about you guys? Now here's the more distorted version. And I'm just going to tell you right now, I've heard that sound on a lot of records in the last 10 or 15 years. Listen to how flat that snare drum is. I don't mean in terms of pitch, I mean in terms of dynamics. No sans amp, distorted sans amp. Listen to how punchy it's made the bass drum too. It's almost like it's moved the fundamental up of the bass drum. That's dry. A lot more low mid on the kick drum there. And that's just what we're adding. You buying it? Let's move into 11. Another amp emulator here. So here's our kick and snare. Here is 11. Whoa. Here's a little more extreme version of 11. So obviously, aggression here, right? I mean, if you're looking to make something really aggressive sounding, this is not a bad way to go. Let's listen to kick and snare plus the first version of 11. Kind of grinds up the hi hat bleed and stuff, doesn't it? Here's the extreme version. It's also why you would have to be very judicious with this. Right? This kind of stuff, for my money, works great if you just want to change the character of the drum kit. You know, for a verse or a chorus or a bridge or something, these kind of moves 
are really, really effective if you can do this. It can be kind of this head-turning moment in your mixes. Okay. Let's move to Smack. It's going to be this guy. Here's our basic kick and snare. Definitely some compression going on there. Here's the more extreme version. Definitely some compression there. Right, let's do them as adders now. So here's our basic kick and snare and the first version of Smash. really like that. Let's go to the extreme version. Look how much longer the snare drum lasts now. Just bass or just kick and snare and then the extreme smack. Okay, how about a rouser? Let's go to a rouser. Basic. Okay. And I'll freely admit that's more compression than I would probably use in the rouser. I kind of got this one set up too aggressive. Here's the more extreme version, if you can do that. And if you take a look at these two different units there that I've got up on the screen, look at the difference in the distortion content, uh, which is this area right here, standby. Right, so that's the basic arouser. Version. Right, so let's go kick and snare plus the basic version. Ah, listen to how much much more far much more ah, how much far ahead the drum the snare drum sounds. Now so much more forward there. thing that's really cool there to me, to my ears, is that the snare comes forward, but the hi-hat doesn't seem to come with it, right? Let's listen to the extreme version. See, there the hi-hat comes with it, right? Kind of getting the picture there? Let's move on. Let's do some lo-fi. This will be interesting. Clear this out of there. All right, so here's our basic drums again. And then we're going to add in some lo-fi here. Remember, this was the really wacky one. Here's the lo-fi. That's pretty lo-fi by my ears. Let's listen to the extreme version. So let's listen to those as adders now. So here's our basic drums, and then we'll go back to the uh, the primary lo-fi. That's the extreme lo-fi. Drums. Both. Harmonics, pretty wild, huh? 
All right, let's take a shot at Inflator. Looks like we got about five or six more to go. I hope you guys can hang in there with me. We'll make it a long one today. I've been gone for a couple of weeks. What can I tell you? All right, so here's our basic signal. This one's really subtle. You gotta be really paying attention to catch this one. Here's Inflator. And definitely hear it if you know what to listen for there. Here's Extreme Inflator. Back to the primary one more time. And then we will listen to both. All right, so this is the first inflator that's going to get added in. So again, really natural sounding there. You know, like the overall characteristic does not change dramatically of the drum kit there, but there is harmonic information in there as we saw, right? So the Oxford stuff is really, really transparent sounding. I love using the inflator on acoustic guitar. That's one of my favorite things to use it on. Really great. Really. Okay. All right, now we're gonna get into the real fun. I'm gonna go here. If you want aggression, we got aggression, right? All right, so here's our basic drums. is our pedal kind of weird that's kind of somewhere in between lo-fi and sans amp to my ears right kind of similar kind of thing there here's the more extreme version so we'll start with the basic version plus Tell, there's not a whole lot more saturation added to that. I mean, that is li literally one, maybe two clicks on the saturation knob. Now, it's probably as good a time as any to kind of share this with you. You know, one of the aspects that I learned kind of the hard way to some degree with doing these kind of things is, especially on a snare drum, it's the most noticeable of it. You can take a snare drum that is not honky, meaning probably doesn't have a lot of 400 in it, and if you start adding this process to it, especially harmonic information to it, all of a sudden you'll be telling the drum guy, hey man, it's honking like crazy, please try to tune that drum, when in fact it's the harmonic processor that's doing it. Okay, so you've gotta be really careful here, especially adding harmonics to you know, drums that have a fundamental. I mean, think about what the fundamental of a, of a typical snare drum is about 200. First harmonic is going to be 400. Who wants a whole lot more 400 in their snare drum? Well, in stages, yes, but you can get it way out of whack here. If you start adding harmonics trying to get brightness out of the snare and it gets really honky, chances are you're going to need to balance what you're doing there. Okay, so just a word to the wise there. Let's look at that second pedal now. Here's our basic bass and drums. Listen to the difference in those two pedals now, right? A lot more gritty distortion in this pedal compared to the previous one. Here's the other version. More so. And ironically, this sounds like just really poor tape recording to me, or like, you know, really early, late 50s, early 60s tape recording. You could hear this kind of thing going on. All right, let's add them together. Right, here's your basic drums. The next one up will be the first version. The thing I picked up on when I was pulling this together this morning is this here, to me, sounds like John Mellencamp, early 80s. It sounds like Arnoff playing that piccolo snare that was tuned up to the moon. And then just 
distorted. That sounds very much like Scarecrow or something like that to me. Kind of cool, huh? All right, let's move on to the waves and then we'll sneak out of here. So here is your, let's see, we'll do this guy first. I didn't set up extreme versions of this. We're just gonna go through the one, two, three versions of this. So here's the red 17. And you can tell that's pretty cool sounding right there. It's really smooth. It's got a distorted element to it, very controlled brightness. Remember, this has got equalization in it too, remember, so don't let it fool you. That's probably why it sounds so smooth. Right, and here's the extreme version. Oh, actually, I'm sorry, don't have extreme versions of these. Uh, we're just going to do these. So here's the kick and snare, and then I'll add the waves with it. Again, we're kind of back to Scarecrow there again. Pretty similar. So the question, you know, becomes sometimes, well, you know, when would you use these things? Would I use this on a jazz thing? You bet I would. You bet I would. Try to make a jazz kit sound more kind of a little more glued together, something like that. Sure, sure I would. Uh, especially, you know, especially something like an uh, inflator, that would be great in a, in a jazz setting for sure. But, you know, in terms of just using harmonic content to make something jump to life, sure, I would do that in jazz without a question. But you'd be careful with it if you're going to use it on instrumentation, right? Let's go to the next uh, plug in here. That's this guy. This is the tape machine. Now added with the kick and snare. That's good, for, but for my money, not as good as the Red 17. I, I bet this would actually sound really good across the mix bus or something like that. I'm not sure I care for it as much on drums. We'll go to the last Abbey Road plug-in. This is the vinyl thing. Let's see how vinyl does with this. Actually sounds kind of interesting, right? Get a little bump in the bottom, a little bump in the very, very top of that. That actually sounds better than I thought it was going to. Let's listen to it with the kick and snare. Definitely pulls the hi-hat forward there. Kind of brightness kind of steals the body away from the snare drum there. All right. Well, fellas, that's all I have to show you there. I mean, that's a ton of stuff to go through there. But and you know, if you're not careful, obviously at some point you just go, I don't know what I'm hearing anymore. I I can't hear. But if you do these kind of things over and over, especially in a studio setting or a relatively high resolution listening environment you'll start to pick up the differences and uh, you know, your approach will get a lot more refined because you'll have these kind of targets in your mind of going, oh, okay, yeah, I know how to get that sound. Hang on, let me, go, let me go get this device and I can go do that, right? It'll help you parse this world of processing that we have out there to do this, right? So, uh, you know, I encourage you to, to play around with these things. They're, they're great to teach with as much as anything, right? Oh, let's see. I'm just reading through some of the chats here. Just hang with me for a second. Yeah, you're not far away from the whole snare thing with Cougar. Well, yeah, he doesn't like he doesn't like to be called Cougar. Just so you guys know. I know. Um, I worked for him. I, I I definitely know he doesn't like to be called that. So. Yeah, we I assisted on one of his last singles, and he was. We had a lot of notes about the snare, and it had to really be pingy, and you know, because yeah. he said that's his signature thing, and it's got to be that. And I also did a couple of events with. Um, uh, with him, private event out on the island, and um, that was also a thing with the snare. Yeah. So yeah, yeah. you know, it's, you just, it's one of those things that can be. I mean, you can have really good control over it in the studio, but boy, you get into a big ambient place 
with that snare, man, it can it can be a freight train running over you at some point. I mean, it, you know, it can be the only thing you hear in the mix after a while. You just got to be so careful with it, you know. Exactly. So, you know, let's uh, let's share some stories here a little bit uh, before we wrap it up here. Uh, I mean, have you guys, obviously Dennis just shared one of his. Have you guys used a lot of these processors before? You know, how have you used them? What's been going on? You know, they've been out for a little while now, so I'm interested to see how you guys are using these or what you think of them. Jump in anytime. Yeah, go ahead, Martin. Got you, buddy. I can't hear you, though. Let's try that. Mm. The, the old double button switch. Um, yeah, I've been a long time big fan of uh, Smack for both uh, 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 drums and uh, uh, bass guitar. Um, and uh, just uh, the whole uh, element of uh, com uh, compression and harmonics uh, that they add in, in parallel. And I've used them in a number of different ways. Um, sometimes I'll just do shells only, and other times I'll do uh, shells, snares, and tom separately, just so I can affect, uh, you know, post fade the amount of compression by just touching a fader. Yeah. Um, it just, just uh, a big fan of that particular one too. Agreed. But you know, you know, kind of getting back to what Dennis was saying, you know, you kind of have to learn to pick and choose which processor is going to take you to the right place. Like if, if I was working with Mellencamp but, and I was doing Kenny's drums or whoever, I probably wouldn't be using smack there because it's, you know, like it's it. geared more toward fatness than it is yeah. for that, that peak element of the snare. I, I honestly, I would probably use one of the pedals that I, that I chose right, down there if right, I really wanted right, to go right. for that, you know, but the punch in the pillow, effect or as i like to call it the uh the fish tank kick drum <laughs> yeah <laughs> it's like hitting pounding your fist on the side of a 70 gallon fish drill uh yeah. fish tank that's uh definitely a go-to spot cool thing about the the sans amp that i always think is if you want the cardboard box bass drum that's the place to get it like right. it, it'll do that for you without even trying you know or if you want to add that yeah. that cardboard box element to an already puffy bass drum you know those those two things can add together and be really powerful as well so. yeah yeah i think uh the the uh smart uh side of your demonstration here was a fantastic way of uh showing exactly how the harmonics and then looking at uh, uh show up in amplitude and then by switching to the phase trace actually what effect it's having on the tonal characteristic of the input without actually going to EQ. I think that's a big, right. big thing right there. It's, it's hard to explain to somebody, you know, as, as somebody who's even relatively new to this, that yes, you just heard it got brighter. I heard it get brighter, but it was an equalization that did it. <laughs> you exactly. Know? Or, well, if it's just getting brighter, why shouldn't I use an equalizer to do it? Well, let's take a look at the phase trace when you put in that equalizer now as opposed to the harmonics doing it, you know, very, very, there are two very different worlds there, you know, well, and, I and you know, the old recording guys got it. They did. They, they understood it because they avoided equalization like the plague, you know? Yeah. So, hey, Robert, so let me give you one more thing that I actually, I don't know if you, some of you older guys have ever heard about this one. And I, it was, it took me by complete surprise working with some of the studio guys. They kept a paver about this big, granite or as massive or as, as much mass as you could and you put it inside the drum kick mm -hmm. the kick drum and that was almost like a process on its own yeah, yeah. I, I highly recommend it it was like a, a two a, a good 2 db of umph that uh, you can't explain yeah i've done a similar thing where we've taken uh, i mean a considerable sandbag and done the same thing where the sandbag is not touching either front or back head but it yeah, is just sandbag, something, yeah, something that has I mean, mass or like, like probably, an elevator weight or uh, yeah. something like a, a thick paper granite it has to have a lot of mass to it. I mean, this and it's sandbag no, it's nothing we, like it. we've been putting in there in a, a specific shape so that it'll lay in the drum without touching either front or back head, but it probably weighs 35 pounds. I mean, even when you just hit the bass drum, you just go, oh, wow, that is. Yeah, it's in, in since then, you hit it right away. Yeah, yeah, that's true. That's a good one. Mm -hmm. Good call. 
All right. Well, we're coming up on two hours. I knew we were going to be here a long time with this one, but I, you know, I, like I said, you can just go so deep on this one. And honestly, I had a, a ton more processors that I was going <laughs> to kind of showcase here, but I just thought, okay, no, I will be here for a couple of days doing this. But I encourage you to play around with these, you know, <clears throat> and really, uh, I, I don't, I don't want to say it's a challenge, but one of the things you got to got to get your head around is, do I want to make that harmonic content part of the source? Or do I want to make it an addition to the source? That's always the kind of push and pull that takes place for me is do I want it to be, do I want it to be the fundamental sound or do I want it to be an addition to the sound to, to create an overall sound? That, that is the challenge. And just remember, if you're going to use it in addition, you must pay attention to latency, right? Those two sources have to be in time with each other. Otherwise, you're not going to be able to to add them together. And it, it, if you can't do it, it may push you into that situation where you have to use it as the primary source and just get a balance of it, right? So just be careful there uh, and go slow. Don't go crazy, crazy on this till you get out and try it. But I promise you, once you start getting a handle on this and in terms of where you use it, maybe I'll, I'll jump back to Scott's question here, you know, in terms of where I use it, you know, a lot of times, I'll, I'll just use Petty as the example. It's the easiest example. <clears throat> you know, there were elements of Petty that I kept very analog, and some of it I just let be digital. Uh, for instance, and this always surprised people, that the guitars, for the most part, in that show, there was no analog emulation on them. I mean, it didn't need to be on there. There was already so much drive and so much harmonic information on those guitar sounds to begin with. It was a great element uh, to showcase when you stay digital, right? I, I tried it early on where you tried a lot of harmonic content, you know, thing, things like analog channel and things like that, and it just kind of muddied up the sound. It didn't let the sound of those guitars kind of shine through. So I, I took the opposite approach with that. I, I went very digital on guitars, but analog on bass and drums. And in those situations, my chain was normally uh, the twin tube as the preamp emulation, then into a broadband equalizer, something like a Pultec, that would drive into the tape compression, right? Because that's the other kind of secret of tape compression is you want to EQ to it, not after it, right? You can do it if you want to do it. There's no rules here. But if you really want to feel the effects of that tape compression, equalize to it. So I had broadband compression that would drive into the tape compression, and you get a very, very specific sound doing it that way. And then on top of it, I would, I, I would put tape emulation across my mix bus, you know, something, you know, like the waves thing. I, although more often than not, I just used Phoenix uh, as my uh, ability to do that. I, you know, the, there's one setting in Phoenix. I want to say it's radiant. I think it's radiant bright that actually, to my ears, sounds very much like overdriven 456, uh, Ampex 456. So that, that's kind of where I landed on that. So I hope that answered your question, Scott, in terms of signal chain, et cetera. Uh, Justin, you got a question there, brother? Come on. Uh, yeah, I was. Uh, if you were going to put a bunch of these plugins on your console to try to emulate a analog console, I'm guessing Phoenix would be the one with the least latency and least DSP usage. Uh, yeah, probably, probably both. Uh, but keep in mind now. Again, you know, as I said earlier, you know. Emulation is a multi-stage game. If you're trying to pick one to make it sound like analog, probably not going to be satisfying for you. And remember, Phoenix is essentially tape emulation, right? Even though Dave yeah. Hill has, has designed things like, you know, there's a, uh, a plugin in Pro Tools called Heat, which is actually their preamp emulation, you know, that they use in Pro Tools, which I think, you know, I'm, I'm hoping we're going to bring into SXL at some point so you can have some preamp emulation uh, you know, in the actual console itself, uh, above and beyond what you would use in plugin. But just remember, it's a multi-stage game, right? It's not just a one, one plugin is going to make me sound analog. That's no different than saying the preamp in my digital console is going to give me an analog sound. Not enough. Not enough, right? You gotcha. follow me there? Yep. Okay. Uh, wow, I got somebody who just showed up. Let me let them in. Maybe they got a question. <laughs> <laughs> All right, anybody else? I hope this was fun for you today. This was, this was a fun one to pull together. 
All right, well, that's right on the two hour mark. So I'm definitely gonna pull the ripcord there. Uh, thanks a ton for showing up, guys. Remember, we are, we will not be next week, but the following week will be, we're going every other week now. Uh, so thanks for tuning in. Spread the word on these things so we can get more people here. And I thank you for coming. I'll see you in some other place on the web over the next few weeks. Thanks, Robert. Thanks, guys. Not, we'll see Robert, you. Not that you've been